From the far reaches of space to the darkest places on Earth. Join us as we explore the haunted, the cryptid, the creepy, and more. Exposing Reality Radio presents the Spectral Wolf Pack Show. Your paranormal nightmare with your host, Alexander Bobolinsky. What is up, Wolf Pack? We are here tonight on this beautiful Wednesday night. We got an awesome show lined up. Uh, before we get into it, I just want to tell you guys a little story about last night. Uh, so it was the full moon. Um, I was up in my room just hanging out. And all of a sudden, I see this really bright flash of light right right beside me. Um, and I was like, whoa, that was awesome. Because I haven't seen one of those in a little while. Uh, it's been actually... Uh, it's been a while since I've seen a flash of light, uh, specifically in this house, too. But the next day, today, I was talking to Brittany, and she actually saw something as well. She was uh, walking up to my room, which is the old stairwell that led up into the servants' quarters of the house. Because some of you might know, we live in a 116-year-old house. And she was walking up there, and she said she saw this triangle of light sitting in the middle of the stairs. And she said she just walked through it. And when she turned around, it was not there anymore. Uh, she kind of just tries to ignore these things when she sees them because she sees a lot in our house. Uh, but it was just kind of an interesting little coincidence. We both saw some sort of light anomalies yesterday in the house. Um, today I actually found out about a new possible location deep in the woods about a mile from my house. Uh, there's some old mines and old mine buildings that I did not know about um, so I'm going to be trying to scope that out very soon. So anyway, guys, tonight I've got a very awesome guest. I actually saw him for the first time at Mothman Fest two years ago, and that is Colin Schneider. He is one of the youngest active cryptozoologists in the world. At only 18, he has been lecturing, researching, and writing on strange creatures for over five years. Colin has appeared on dozens of podcasts, has been a guest of numerous conferences, and is the co-author of the award-winning book Ramblings of Teenage Cryptozoologists uh, with Tyler, I hope I'm saying his name right, Tyler Hoke, Hoke. and hold on one sec, guys, Uh, Tyler Houck, and I'm going to bring Colin in right now. Colin, I'm sorry for slaughtering your friend's name. What is up, man? (laughs) No, it's all good. Um... Trust me, for the first uh, two years of our friendship, I mispronounced his name all the time. So it's all right. Um, but it's pronounced Hauk, uh, Hauk. just for uh, clarification. Just like it's spelled too. Like I, I do this with every every guest, or you know, your last name I was familiar with, but some it's just like I I can't get it. Even when the, I'll like ask him before the show, I'll be like, I meant to ask you about his name, but um, but yeah, man, how how are you doing tonight? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. It's been a long week, and it's only Wednesday, so uh, you know how it goes. Yeah, seriously, the uh, the old hump day, uh, middle of the week. Yeah. I understand. It's it's been a quite a week too for me. I don't know about you, but uh, <laughs> it's been interesting. But um, so I first saw you. I remember you came up to my booth at Mothman Fest, and I was like, "This dude's cool. He's got." got his bow tie on he looks official and then i found out you were speaking there uh unfortunately i didn't get to catch the speech because i was running the booth but man i'm I'm really proud of everything you've done man it's it's a uh, very awesome to see i appreciate it um yeah i have uh talked at mothman two years in a row now and i hope uh that this year will be a third year um and yeah, I like when I'm speaking, I like to wander around and uh, talk to people um, because if, if I'm just cooped up at the uh, table the whole day, I'll go nuts. You yeah. Know? Um, <laughs> I go to these things to meet people and have conversations. And uh, I, I, You guys had some interesting looking stuff on the table, so I had to come over. Definitely. I'm glad you did. And I saw you last year t- briefly, mm-hmm. too. Uh, this past year was, was pretty crazy there with the crowd. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was it was enormous. Um, I think last year was the biggest year yet. Yeah, so, 
That's so awesome. I'm I'm happy to see. I mean, I love that festival. It's so well ran and just like I just have a great time every time I go. Yeah, I tell people if if you're interested in this stuff, um, you know, anything of the paranormal, you know, UFOs, ghosts, cryptids, whatever, anything weird, you have to go to the Mothman Festival at least once. It's it's a it's an experience unlike anything else. And um, I've been going every year for the past five years now, um, and I've loved every single time. So I agree, man. It's became like a little tradition for me. This will be my fourth year this year, and it, it's right around my birthday every year, so I'm kind of making it like a tradition. And I'd always wanted to go up there to see the TNT area in Point Pleasant, and now that I go like every year, it's just so fun, so fun and awesome. Oh, yeah, it really is. Um and uh, I've gotten to know a handful of people in the town uh, fairly well. Um, and I just, I love that town, too. Um, Point Pleasant is just a wonderful place. Prehistoric Matt in the chat wants to know, and I don't know if they do, but do they have moth dogs, which I guess is like a hot dog with, with mothmen? <laughs> I, 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 I don't can't think remember. so. I do know that uh, there's a little Mexican place on Main Street that has uh, Mexican uh, Mothman um, burritos, Mm -hmm. and those are awesome. My dad and I get one every year. And then they have um, Mothman waffles, I think, someplace sells them, and they they probably have moth dogs somewhere. (laughs) I I just haven't seen it. Um, It's... Mothman's enormous. You can't you can't see everything um, when you go. So they probably do somewhere. It's so true, and it's like, it's it's in a small town, but it's seriously a huge fest. And like like he said, you can't, you will not see everything. You can try. I tried. <laughs> um, so tell us a little bit about like uh, your, your backstory. Like, how did you get into uh, you know into this stuff? So I've always kind of been interested in this stuff. Um, you know, especially for physiology. Um, I've always loved animals, and um, the idea of discovering new species has always excited me. Um, and I remember when I was a kid, I used to watch uh, Monster Quest all the time. And um, because I was watching it so much, uh, Lauren Coleman you, uh, t- kind of became like a childhood hero of mine. For those of you that don't know, Lauren is kind of uh, like the the... Uh, big kahuna of uh, cryptozoology. He's really kind of the top dog. Mm-hmm. And um, he runs a museum in Maine. And um, uh, like six years ago now, I got a chance to go up uh, to Maine with my family on vacation. And I begged my dad to go to, to make a stop in Portland because we were going up to Acadia National Park um, to spend two weeks in a in a little cabin and then, you know, enjoy the national park. But, um, I basically begged my father to, uh, take a pit stop in Portland as he passed to visit the museum. And I remember walking in and there was this long hallway as you walk into the museum. That, this was the second location the mu- museum was at. The museum's at a third location now that is um, a lot nicer than uh, the previous one. Because mm-hmm. um, uh, the previous one was kind of like this, it was, it was behind um, a uh, used bookstore, which was really cool, but it was hard to find. Um, and so to get in, there was this just very long, dark hallway and just a little door outline. And you could kind of see like a Bigfoot and a couple other things uh, through the doorway. And we were about halfway through that hallway when Lauren Coleman uh, steps out from behind the wall. And I just stopped. <laughs> and my, uh, my, my little 12-year-old heart is beating out of my chest. I'm about to have a panic attack. And um, because it was like uh, I was, it was like I was, uh, if I was a basketball fan meeting LeBron James or something, like mm-hmm. it was that big of a deal um, to me. And I, I literally just stopped and couldn't talk for about five minutes 
And my, my dad uh, chatted with Lauren for a minute and uh, introduced me and explained that I was super excited about coming. And uh, Lauren was very nice and, uh, and laughed about it, but I, I still couldn't speak. <laughs> um, and I remember we spent about three hours in this little two-room museum. Um, I just combed the entire place. And I remember walking out with a stack of books, I bought one of every copy of um, uh, a book in the uh, gift shop and like two t-shirts and a couple little like uh, toys and stuff. I spent all of my uh, uh, savings from uh, for vacation, uh, the first day of vacation. <laughs> and I remember walking out with a stack of books wearing a new t-shirt thinking, man, this is so cool. I want to look for monsters. And I haven't really um, looked back since. I uh, started by joining the largest cryptozoological organization in the world, which is the Center for, Center for Fortean Zoology, based out of the UK. Um, the director of said organization, uh, Jonathan Downs, um, contacted me after he found out I joined and kind of took me under his wing, helped teach me how to research and think critically about this stuff, um, and gave me the confidence to start going to conferences and talk to people. I wasn't attending, I, I was just attending them. I wasn't speaking yet, but um, through going to the conferences, I got to meet my other mentor, Stan Gordon, who... Um, a lot of your listeners probably are not familiar with, but if you are from Pennsylvania, you absolutely would have heard of him. He is the head honcho of UFO and Bigfoot research in Pennsylvania and one of the best researchers all around I've ever met. And uh, Stan, uh, every conference I would go to that uh, Stan was at, he would grab me wheel me around to all of the other speakers and vendors that were important, um, point at them and said, look, then point at me and said, this is the future of cryptozoology. Talk to him, learn from him. He will learn from you. And then left. Um, and that's how I got to meet, uh, some of the people that I have, um, close relationships with. Uh, now and some of the people I work um, pretty closely with um, when it comes to research. Um, so I, I've been I've been ex extremely lucky. Um, both Stan and John started pushing me to uh, write more, and um, you know I started writing articles, and which eventually led to my book. Yeah, um, which came out in August uh, that I did with uh, Tyler Hauk. It's a collection of independent articles and essays about a variety of different cryptozoological topics. We tried to cover weird stuff over normal stuff. Like, we don't really talk about Bigfoot and Mothman and stuff. Uh, instead, we talk about fairies and uh, this very obscure lake monster documentary and um, uh, vampire cats and um, giant frogs nice. and just some really fun stuff. Um, because that's what we're really interested in is the more obscure stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess that's just a, a really long-winded answer to your uh, short question. <laughs> no, I mean, I love it. I'm loving the, the whole story. And uh, I got to say, I love those obscure cryptids as well. What what are some of your favorites, would you say? I, I don't... So I try, when I'm doing research, to remain objective. I don't try to, unlike a lot of researchers... Um, through no fault of their own. I don't, I don't fault people for this, but they seem to um, get attached to the idea of Bigfoot or mm. to the idea of Dogman or something like that. And because of that, they will not listen to anything that is against or contrary to what they think about that because, because they, they've personified these, these um, ideas, right? 
So I try to avoid, when I'm doing research on something, I try to avoid having a favorite. Uh, there's certainly topics I'm more interested in than I'm not. Um, I'm especially interested in uh, cryptid, supposed cryptid predation on livestock. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a really obscure topic that only I ever talk about unless someone's talking about it concerning uh, the chupacabra. Mm -hmm. But... Um, when it comes to supposed Bigfoot predations or um, dogman attacks or uh, vampire cats, I've never ever seen or read anything, anyone really talk about these in, in an extensive manner. I, I've only ever seen little blurbs about it in books about a variety of weird creatures. Yeah. Um, so uh, I don't, I don't really have in a, a favorite. Um, if I did, it'd probably be the Chupacabra. I'm very critical of the Chupacabra. I don't think it's anything. I think it's a, it, uh, the, the Puerto Rican version was uh, mass hysteria associated with um, just, just um, in a, the, the uh, uh, fallacy of our memories, um, while the Texas Chupacabra, the, the blue dogs, is just uh, mangy coyotes and dogs. It's pretty much a given at this point. Um, but I love the name and I love the idea of a gargoyle-esque monster that, that runs around and, and drinks the blood of things. Mm -hmm. And that's not at all what the Chupacabra really is anymore, but I, I, I find that fun. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, there's a, uh, there's a restaurant in downtown Birmingham where I live that has a, uh, Chupacabra painted on the wall and I always like to go there and eat, uh, Prehistoric Matt in the chat said he's working on a drawing of Chupacabra. Is there any obscure Chupacabra details he should add, would you say? So a lot of the sketches and drawings out there are not true. The original image of the Chupacabra we got was from uh, one eyewitness in uh, 96, um, I, I, almost a year after the first predation story started uh, was when the creature was first supposedly seen. Um, off the top of my head, um, the, the more alien-looking um, sketches are probably the closest, except it doesn't have claws like a lot of people think. Uh, she described it as actually having fingers with longer fingernails, mm -hmm. but not claws. Um, she also said that it had a uh, yellow skin, but like a thin layer of gray hair around its body. Um, she didn't see a tongue. Um, she said it had a frog like face. Um, and yeah, I think that's about it. The, the spines on the back, mm -hmm. um, were, were, um, just like quick little spikes, they like like quills of a of a um, porcupine, not like a big like um, stegosaurus spike. They were just little slits of a spine, almost. Yeah, I'm gonna have to send you a picture of that one at the uh, at that restaurant. They 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 did a decent job, I would say, from that that description. Um, so going into the like cattle mutilations and stuff, I've actually been having a lot of cases here recently that have had some things like that going on. Um, tell us a little bit about all that. So I don't research cattle mutilations. Um, so there's a distinct difference between decrypted predations and cattle mutilations. Mm -hmm. um, that being, in cattle mutilations, uh, uh, according to uh, ufologists and everything, the the like biggest thing is that there's no obvious sign of why it's dead, right? It's like they just dropped dead one day. Mm -hmm. While um, cryptid predations, what I'm interested in, obviously something killed them. It's very obvious something predatory killed them. The only question is what? Um, and that's what I'm interested in. What killed these animals? And believe it or not, um, you can tell a lot about what attacked an animal from the corpse. Um, 
I actually own uh, four or five books on how to identify predators and predation. They're really gruesome, and I don't really want to get into a lot of the details. Yeah. But, um, they're, right, right. Um, but it's, it's fascinating, and you can definitely tell if uh, the animal was attacked by, say, a puma or by a bobcat or by a wolf or by a domestic dog. There are telltale signs, and... Uh, you can pretty definitively uh, discern what caused it. Mm -hmm. um, I have over the, so last year in like April was when I stopped doing uh, this project because it was just I kept working on it and working on it. And I wasn't really getting anywhere. Um, I'm going. What I want to do is go to the UK and probably Australia as well, because they have a lot of predation um, accounts, and get a wider data set from those as well, those places, mm -hmm. and um, have like a, like a multinational view of this. But strictly in the continental U.S., I have logged between 1810 and uh, 2017, uh, approximately 2,700 reports of these supposedly mysterious attacks wow. on animals. Wow. That's, that's a lot. <laughs> I'll, ex I'll accept mm, probably 50 of them. I've been able to dis discern what caused it. Um, either I, I received photos of the courts and was able to look at it and say, ah, oh, yeah, this was a coyote, or ah, oh, yeah, that was a domestic dog, or ah, oh, yeah, that was a puma. Um, or just from the anecdotal evidence, I could, be, I, I'm able to, to reasonably determine that it was something known. So I have about 50 cases or so that are labeled unknown. Now, a large amount of those cases, I'd say probably about 75% of them, are labeled unknown just because there weren't enough details or um, I wasn't able to discern um, exactly what did it. Um, like there were one or two that I was, I was sure it was some kind of canine. I just can't be sure what canine um Probably a dog, a domestic dog, or um, a coyote. But just to be safe, I keep it under unknown with that suggestion. Um, and then there's five or six that I just label straight up weird. Um, and those actually don't have as much to do with the actual animals being killed as much as like the eyewitness accounts that are uh, are accompanying it. Um, I've one story which I, I'm, I'm pretty sure is a hoax, but I don't want to jump on it yet. I'm still trying to track down the person that was uh, being interviewed in the newspapers in the 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, El Reno, Oklahoma, 1970, December of 1970, this unnamed farmer claimed that one night he heard his chickens and his chicken coop just go berserk. They were squawking and, and screaming and crying and going nuts. Um, he throws on his boots, throws on his jacket, grabs his gun to go see what was going on. So he, he was expecting some kind of varmint to be in there messing around. Um, and when he got out there, now keep in mind, there was only about what I'm able to estimate only about 10 minutes between the time that he heard the squawking start and by the, like when he reached the chick, the chicken coop. But by the time he had gotten there, all 170 chickens were gone. The door to the coop was ripped, up, ripped off and broken in half. There was blood and feathers everywhere, and there were ape-like footprints on the floor of the chicken coop, outside the chicken coop, um, and bloody handprints on the walls and the door. Wow. That's insane. <laughs> so... The newspapers labeled this the El Reno Chicken Man, which I love. <laughs> yeah. um, and um, the, the guy sent the door to um, 
at the time, the director of the Oklahoma Zoo, Lawrence Curtis. Now, Curtis actually was well-known in the area for um, being able to identify your weird footprints. He was kind of like uh, Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum before Meldrum was active. Mm -hmm. Um, And he determined that it definitely was not a bear, and it definitely was not a human. He said that if he had to guess, it would be a gorilla. But he said it was the, the footprints and the, the handprints were too large to be a gorilla's. And also, what in God's name would a gorilla be doing midwinter in El Reno, Oklahoma, stealing chickens? Yeah. <laughs> my only my only issue with this case is that 170 chickens disappeared in the span of 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. Even if you have, say, three Bigfoot, I don't think they'd be able to manage it. And this was definitely only one supposed Bigfoot. Um, I am not convinced. Either the newspapers played up the number of chickens, the uh story of the farmers was not entirely accurate as to like how long it took him to get out to the the coop or it's a hoax and I really don't want it to be a hoax but I'm not sure I'm still trying to track down Lawrence Curtis Mm -hmm. um, but in uh, I think 2003 he left the Oklahoma Zoo and after that He's kind of disappeared. If any of your listeners know how to contact him, please let me know. Yeah. I'd be fascinated to have a conversation with him. Definitely. Um, wow. But I have not been able to track him down. Yeah, I mean, like you said, like how that that's just that's so many chickens to just go go, go vanish. Um, wow. So you said 170 too? Is what they said? 170. 170. That's... Which is an incredible amount of chickens. Yeah, it is. Um, <laughs> I, have a, I have a friend who has 10 chickens, and sometimes it seems like there are 170. Mm-hmm. So I can't even imagine. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Like, I'm trying... I, I recently heard of a story about, uh, I think, 12 chickens going missing. Uh, but, yeah, I, I don't... 170 is like, like how could you even carry those chickens? Even if you were several Bigfoot, <laughs> like it, would, it just doesn't make sense. My my estimate is uh, that a single Bigfoot can only carry about five chickens uh, if they're if they're alive. If they kill them first, which would take longer, I would estimate they could probably carry about 20. Um, but that's nowhere near 170. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that makes sense. But yeah, like we're, you know, like I I can't wait to see if you actually get to talk to that guy and, and get any more details about this. Cause I I hadn't even heard about this. As far as I know, he's like 70 now, 70 (laughs) or 80. So, um, if I can get in contact with him, that would be awesome, but I, I, I'll probably need to do it sooner rather than later. Yeah. Um, and every, well, about a, once a month now, I'll sit on my computer for a bit, trying new methods of tracking them down. I've contacted the zoo several times. Uh, they aren't able to tell me anything. I've looked in uh, newspaper records for obituaries. I've looked in a variety of things, and I just have not been able to find him. Anywhere. My suspicion at this point is that he bought an island somewhere in the Caribbean and is living the rest of his days <laughs> completely unplugged from everything else, just so no one can ask him about Bigfoot footprints anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't blame him. I mean, I, that sounds like a good way to to live. I mean, I love talking about Bigfoot, though, so, you know, I would still <laughs> want to talk to people, but I wouldn't mind living on the island. Right. Might even have some chickens. I don't know. <laughs> what uh let's see i had one more question okay one more question about this and then i got a question from the chat but i wanted to ask you about uh, uh-huh. in, in some of these cases uh do you often have like the fences being knocked down and things like that because that's something that i've been hearing in some of the cases i've been working on here yes but only exclusively in anomalous big cat stories mm-hmm. um so 
um, strange big cats or anomalous big cats like to, from what I can tell, when they're trying to get to a piece of meat, a life, uh, a handful of animals, unlike most wild cats, anomalous big cats, for some reason, according to the stories, will just rip open the fences. Um, I remember a story from, also from the 70s, if I remember correctly, 74, but I might be off on that year. Um, I know it was in the spring of some, some mid to early 70s year. Um, anyway, uh, Southern Ohio, uh, Southwest Ohio, um, for months, sheep farmers in this small little community were reporting that their sheep were being killed, drained of blood, and badly mutilated by some unseen killer. At the same time, people were seeing uh, Black Panthers in the area, so obviously it must be the Black Panthers. Um, and the farmers started getting very paranoid, so they would, like, lock up their sheep in, like, like, like uh, several layers of fencing. And this would not stop the killer. It would rip open the gates, gnaw on the wood, and then keep going. Actually, in the Cryptozoology Museum in, in Maine, there is a piece of wood from one of the fences with bite marks in it. Wow. Um, yeah, I remember earlier this year, or last year uh, in September, I visited the museum again because I was speaking at a conference that Lauren was putting on just across the street. And um, I, I remember wandering through the museum, seeing the uh, Black Panthers exhibit, seeing that piece of wood and about losing my mind because in 10 minutes, I was about to give a talk about, that, uh, about uh, this topic and bring up that very case. Um, <laughs> it was awesome. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the cat would supposedly rip open these gates, gnaw on the wood, and then keep going toward the sheep. Now, first off, I don't think if there was a weird big cat in the area, I don't think it was the thing killing the sheep. Because the sheep were ripped open and it just kind of ripped apart. Um, I think what was probably killing the sheep was um, a domestic dog, maybe maybe a couple. Um <laughs> A lot of people don't like to admit this, but their uh, dogs, if they will, if they get around prey animals that are moving a lot, they will kill, and they will kill a lot, and they will not eat them. They will just play with them. Um, even uh, Fido that's uh, sitting on your uh, living room floor while you listen to this podcast has... Um, a, a a serial killer mind to it when it comes to livestock. Um, so when animals get loose, uh, domestic dogs get loose, they will just kill and kill and kill if they get the opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, even things as big as a sheep, I'm not even joking. Um, we have a um, wolf dog uh, that's enormous. He's like 170 pounds. And he got loose one day, ran across the street, uh, where there's a cattle farm and started chasing the cows trying to bring them down before we got over there and grabbed him. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, so dogs will try to get whatever they can get. Yeah. Um, but anyway, back to the, back to the, the, the southeastern Ohio, uh, southwestern Ohio case. Yes, um, I'm pretty sure it was a dog. Mm -hmm. um, that was killing the animals. I have no earthly idea how the gates were ripped open. Yeah. Um, maybe, I don't know, um, I, I think that some of the teeth marks could quite possibly be dogs, but um, I don't know why a dog would be gnawing on the wood. Maybe it just needed a chew toy. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that it was a dog that was killing the animals. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, it's not unheard of with anomalous cat cases to hear that the fence is getting ripped apart, uh, which is interesting because cats would just go over it. Mm -hmm. They're agile enough, and if there's a tree nearby, uh, it's not even breaking a sweat for them. Um, 
dogs can even get over some fences. Uh, so it, it's interesting that the, that the fences do get destroyed sometimes, but that doesn't mean it's, it's anything anomalous. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very interesting. I'm going to, uh, I'll have to send you, if I get any pictures of, uh, I've been trying to get the people who I've been talking to to send some pictures of what's been going on. I'll definitely have to send those to you and see what you think about uh, some of this stuff in Alabama. Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, So we had a question from the chat in kind of a different direction. Uh, I would like uh, Colin's opinion on the Jersey Devil or what he may think inhabits the Pine Barrens of southern New Jersey. And they said they've forgotten the details, but they do believe a number of campers came up missing or found mutilated. Do you know anything about any of that? No. So, well, I, I do. Um, the no was to the, the number of campers. Um, yeah. That was a thing that got started online um, and really kind of took off with, like, the, the creepypasta waves. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, uh, there, there's nobody that's gone missing and then found mutilated. Yes, people go missing in the woods. Uh, yes, people go missing in the Pine Barrens. No, that does not mean it's the Jersey Devil. It's just a normal occurrence. Um that happens everywhere. It's sad, but it, it's true. Um, now, when it comes to the Jersey Devil, so Ivan T. Sanderson, one of the greats when it comes to Christian Zoology, not enough people in the field today know who he was. Um, he is easily my favorite nature writer, let alone my favorite Christian Zoologist who have ever lived. Mm-hmm. He had a fascinating idea. So, um, at the time that the New Jersey, at the time that the Jersey Devil um, story really came about, there were these two shady um, real in, real estate investors running around New Jersey at the time trying to buy a property. Sanderson um, suggested and gave some evidence that, uh, for the life of me, is not coming to mind. Um, that suggested that these two guys came up with the whole idea based off of um, a vague folk tale about the Leeds uh, devil, the, you know, the mother Leeds, um, mm-hmm. her 13th child, that type of stuff. Bring, bringing that, that idea and making it into a, a beast type thing. Um, and... Uh, they started, um, according to Sanderson, they started to uh, tell stories about it, get people to panic about it, um, all in the hopes that people will leave, sell their places, they can snap them up for cheap and then flip them um, and make a lot of money. Um, and it just kind of got out of control after that. Um, I think that's a fascinating idea. And there actually was a book that came out last year or two years ago. I don't, I can't remember if it was 18 or 17. Um, all about um, the Jersey Devil, talking about how uh, Quakers started the um, Leeds Devil uh, story. And um, I haven't actually read it. I've, I've, I've read articles um, that are excerpts of it. And I, I, I know it brings Ben Franklin actually into the mix. Um, and I'm not actually exactly sure how, but if you're interested in Jersey Devil, um, I heard that it's an excellent book, and it's actually sitting on my bookshelf, waiting to be read when I get some time. Nice. <laughs> um, I've got so, I've got plenty of books like that too. My son. <laughs> yeah, there's like a, a good stack of them. I'm trying to get to. Um, yeah, well, well, that's that's awesome. I appreciate the information. Mm-hmm. I know that they, they, they do as well. I wanted to ask you a little bit, uh, so you live in Ohio. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the Ohio cryptids and, and legends? Um, so Ohio is a, yeah, Ohio is a bunch. Um, my favorite of the whole bunch is no one else's favorite, um, partially because there's not much to it, but I find it fascinating. Um, it's uh, Orange Eyes. Mm-hmm. And it's it's just a it's just a story. There's not really anything to it, which is why I feel comfortable saying it's my favorite. <laughs> um, all it is is uh, just a lover's lane tale, you know. Um, teenagers uh, park the car somewhere secluded. They start getting a little frisky, and um, one of them looks up and spots a pair of large, glowing orange eyes coming from the forest. Um, and they hear this low rumble. 
so they panic, turn the car on, and just get out of there. And that's about it. <laughs> um, I, I think Lover's Lane's Lane Tales are absolutely fascinating. Um, and I'm working on a project right now all about uh, Paranormal Roads, mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm bringing that in, and, and that's been involved. Um, but, um, yeah, Orange Eyes is really not enough people talk about it. Um, there's, of course, the Grass Man, which is our local name for uh, Bigfoot. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of people try to make it like a, like a subspecies with some differences, but there's really no difference. It's just another name for Bigfoot. Yes, uh, there's been like five grass domes found, um, which are literally just like big woven grass baskets just turned upside down that look like a hut mm-hmm. um, that people associate with Bigfoot, but I don't really think so. I think they're just hopeful. Mm-hmm. Honestly, um, uh, we have the Loveland Frogman, oh, yeah. which was seen in '55 by two different police officers, officers in two different occasions. Um, it was literally just this three to four feet tall, uh, green, slimy-looking humanoid with webbed feet um, and a frog face walk across the road, climb over um, the guardrail, and just walk away while the police officers stared at it. Um, people have fallen in love with that one. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's just neat because of the name. Um, well, of course, we have uh, Bessie, our uh, Lake Erie uh, Loch Ness Monster, um, which actually our um, the, the Cleveland hockey team is named after it. It's called the uh, Cleveland Monsters. Although nice. originally they were called Lake Erie Monsters, which I liked a lot better. <laughs> um, yeah, they're lo- they're the like, mascots like this little like sea serpent guy peeking out from the water. It's pretty sweet. Yeah. Um, we have a whole bunch. Um, have you, you heard? You know. Of- uh, Ohio's kind of central to a lot of stories as well. Yeah. Like uh, the melon heads. I was about to say uh, that. Are, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which aren't really a cryptid as much as just like a, like a local legend. Um, they're these like uh, three feet foot tall, like like children looking humanoid things with enormous heads mm-hmm. and like yellowish skin. And uh, they're seen all over the place. Sometimes they're said to have like a village out in the forest or uh, they're said to have escaped from this mad scientist lab. Mm-hmm. What's interesting is that they're not unique to Ohio. There are melonhead legends in Michigan, in Pennsylvania, in Maryland, in Delaware, in New York. Um, in Kentucky, in West Virginia, they're all over the place. But Ohio is really the one that everybody remembers. Yeah, uh, the melon heads for, and I find that fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, I, I remember when I was up there, I, I had read about it, and I wanted to go out. There's like that one certain road where they say that the doctor lived or something. I can't remember what it's called, but I, I wanted to try and find it. Uh, but I ended up doing something else. I think I tried to find Helltown. Uh, that ah uh, yes. Yeah. Um, There's like four different locations for Helltown uh, yeah. in Ohio. None of them have anything there. I know. Um, we, we, as far as I know. We looked everywhere. We were asking people in, in uh, I forget which town it is. We were asking people at the local restaurants there about it, and they had heard about it and everything, but, yeah, couldn't really <laughs> tell us anything or give us any leads on where to go. But yeah. Super, uh, I, I love Ohio. I almost moved there myself just because of all, all that going on up there. Have you been up to the Serpent Mounds or anything? No, actually, that'd be down for me. I live in Northeast Ohio, but, um, no, it's on my list. Um, I want to eventually go, um, just because it's such a fascinating site. Um, mountains in general are really neat. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know the whole park around it's really good too. Um, so it's one of the places I want to visit eventually. Nice. Are you up there? Uh, are you, you pretty close to Lake Erie? Oh, uh, about an hour away. I'll be up in Madison, Ohio in, uh, April where we actually filmed a documentary there at Madison seminary. Um, uh, that that will be premiering there and everything. Oh, that's cool. We'll have to we'll have to link up maybe. Have yeah, a, yeah, maybe. Have you had uh, 
So during your, your research and investigations, have you had any encounters yourself? Uh, be it paranormal no. or cryptid? No. So I am almost exclusively a um, historical researcher. So um, I don't go out in the woods looking for Bigfoot. I go on dusty library computers looking for Bigfoot. Um, partially because I am a senior in high school. So with my schedule and um, just how much time I get to work on this stuff, I don't really have the option to go out in the woods for hours on end looking for it. Um, but also, plenty of people are doing that. Not enough people are looking at looking for these really cool, unique stories and trying to figure out what they are and if they have any like significance to the field today. And a lot of them do. And a lot of them are really, really interesting just in general. Um, and, like, I, I, I think uh, field research is extremely important, obviously, but um, historical research, whether or not, say, Bigfoot turns out to be real, historical research will still have significance and viability, while field research will not always necessarily, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying field research is not important. On the contrary, it's, it's essential. But um, not enough people are doing historical research. Um, and because I feel that it's so important, I've been kind of taking that up myself. No, I agree. It's completely important. Like, there's another guy who's uh, one of my good friends, uh, Lewis O'Powell, who's the Southern Spirit Guide, and he does historical research on all the sort of paranormal and spirit hauntings and things like that all through the South. And, like, he's just such a knowledgeable guy, and he doesn't, he's more of, a, like, a researcher as well on that, like, you know, digging into the library, uh, you know, research center and, and finding all these old stories and putting them together. And, like, I think that's extremely important to have. Like, that's awesome. I'm glad that we Thank have you, you guys. I, <laughs> I have fun doing it, too. Um, I just love old newspapers, um, probably because I grew up reading comic books, and, you know, Spider-Man and Superman both worked at a newspaper. Um, so I've always just been fascinated and, and have this love for newspapers. Um, so going through the old ones back when the newspapers were the only way to get news is just really exciting and fascinating for me. Yeah. Um, it's a good time. <laughs> yeah. I think that's, I think that's amazing. And, and I, I totally agree. I, I love, uh, finding those old stories and, and whatnot. And actually recently back to the, uh, talking about the haunted roads and, and lovers lanes. Uh, there's one, a case I've been working on recently, uh, about this mountain called chicken foot and chicken foot road is kind of one of those uh, lovers lanes where people would, you know, back in the day go out and, and get spooked and everything. And, and there's actually some mm -hmm. ghost legends there. I'll have to send you what I found on it. Um, yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, there's quite a few haunted roads in, in Alabama as well. Ooh, I got to tell you this story real quick. This is pretty cool. Uh, just happened a couple days ago. I have to go and investigate it further, but there's this uh, place called Bear Creek Swamp, and uh, it goes down this old road that was like a train trestle, um, and now it's like this old dirt road. And this dude was driving. He said his truck died for about 10 minutes, and he said this creature crawled out of the swamp, and he like finally got his truck to crank, and he said it like ran up and had like it was like a black slimy creature with like really long arms. And he actually sent me pictures of where there's these supposed scratch marks on the side of his truck. So, I'm I'm looking forward that, to checking that out. Yeah, I'd I'd love to see what you find and see some of the pictures and stuff because um that actually sounds pretty similar to uh, a handful of different stories that I've gotten um either directly from people or uh, just through newspapers or just other books. Um, the scratches are not unheard of, especially with swamp creatures, uh, supposedly. So that's, that's really interesting. Yeah. Do you, do you know, uh, much about like, uh, different kind of cryptids that would be in swamps? So 
you kind of have this overarching uh, swamp creature uh, archetype, which is kind of imagine creature from the Black Lagoon, like the lizard creature, mm -hmm. like, you know, like the fish thing um, with like lizard scales and stuff. Um, there's the Fennish Lake Monster in um, Canada that was seen in the 70s that I'm pretty sure turned out to be a hoax. Um, and you have the Bishopsville Swamp Monster, or uh, the, the monster of uh, Skateboard Swamp, the Lizard Man, mm -hmm. uh, that Lyle Blackburn wrote a book on. Literally, he wrote the book on, um, mm -hmm. which is a lot closer to just your classical swamp creature. I mean, I remember reading several stories about, like, um, People being in lakes or swamps and uh, seeing like a Bigfoot creature. Um, you know, there's, there's the skunk ape and the Everglades, which actually is in a swamp. It's a, uh, it's the world's largest slow moving river, which I find really neat. It's not actually a swamp or a marsh, it's a river, yeah. uh, which is awesome. And, uh, you know, there's the skunk ape. There's, there's plenty of large humanoids in uh, swamps, supposedly. Yeah. I don't know how much credence I would put in most of them, but the stories are certainly interesting. Yeah, there's nothing uh, nothing quite like these stories. It gets me all excited, and I want to go out there. <laughs> I want to get out there. Uh, yeah. So, so, yeah. What, uh, what, what can we expect in the future from Crypto Kid? What what all you got in the works? <laughs> um, really, I don't have much. I've um, slowed it down a bit. Um, I'm going to. I'm attending a conference in Rhode Island the last weekend in April, um, and I. Uh, Give me one second. My phone is about to die. I'm so sorry. Oh, it's okay. Not not a problem at all. While he's doing that, um, I, oh, he's back. And I am back. <laughs> Welcome um, back. Uh, so yeah, I'm I'm speaking at a conference in Rhode Island. It's called the X Filers Convention. It's like an X Files fan convention, but it's it's actually a paranormal convention. That should be pretty fun. Um, and the other thing I'm working on is my uh, second book. It's a solo outing about uh, paranormal roads um, and like the, the folklore and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, I have not been doing much. Um, I've been busy with uh, enjoying my last year in high school. Um, next year, uh, I'm going to be taking a gap year before I go to college. So, um, yeah, I'm probably not going to be doing a ton, uh, when it comes to cryptozoology for a while. Um, I'll still be doing a little bit. I'll still be doing radio interviews occasionally, um, writing every now and then, but, um, there's just other stuff going on, you know? Um, I have some other writing projects that I've been working on. I'm trying to, uh, break into the comic book industry actually a bit. Um, nice. That's awesome. Uh, uh, using some of the like skills and, and knowledge I've acquired from my other research um, to help me out in that. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not completely gone from the field, but I am uh, not, I'm not as active as I used to be. Mm -hmm. Well, nothing wrong with that. I mean, you know, Sometimes you need a break, and and uh, also you've already accomplished a lot, and you're still in high school, so, <laughs> so you got plenty of time to uh, thank you to continue and everything. Mm. Uh, what are you planning on uh, majoring in college? I'm not sure. Um, I want to do writing. I want to do um, maybe journalism or something like that. Yeah. But at the same time, I don't want that to be my whole job because if that's my whole job, I will not enjoy it anymore. Um, <laughs> so I'm actually thinking about, uh, so my, my automatic answer used to be just zoology. Mm -hmm. um, but I've become less and less interested in the tedious parts of science and more and more interested in just the uh, results. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't know. I... I 
I'm, I'm thinking about uh, library sciences because um, with my work with the newspapers and stuff, archival stuff has just really piqued my interest. And I love organizing things and I love books. And I really can see myself being a librarian or an archivist. Um, that's, that's what I'm thinking about right now. But ask me again in, in two months <laughs> and it'll probably be something different. Hey, I, I understand completely. When I when I graduated high school, I went straight and uh, and went out to the Appalachian Trail and hiked for like five months. <laughs> so, and then I and then I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. So, uh, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, one of my best friends is a librarian, and she she loves it. And uh, like, I love librarians and archivists because like when we do go try to do this research and things, like they keep it all safe and keep it all organized and it's seriously like it's it's amazing that people do that so absolutely and I've, i'm already getting my foot in the door because i um am planning i'm i'm working toward getting a job at my local library as a shelver um so uh I'm, I've, I've already got my foot in the door <laughs> if you will <laughs> beautiful beautiful um, before my last question, I gotta know uh, uh, if 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 two cryptids went to battle. Let's say, let's say uh, Bigfoot versus Mothman. Who, who do you think would would win that? Well, um, I with the current popular idea as to what these cryptids are. Not that I actually subscribe to either. But uh, the current popular idea, I would have to go Mothman because everyone seems to think that Mothman's an interdimensional being of some kind. And I would imagine that gives it the edge to just a, a, a wood ape. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, I would probably <laughs> agree. I would, I'm, I, Mothman's one of my, uh, one of my love, you know, like I love Mothman. I love Bigfoot too, but I would think mm. that Mothman would have the, the upper hand. He's got he's got the wings too. He can fly. Like, yeah. There, there's a lot he could do, and the red eyes that you know could. Uh, yeah, he hypnotizes Bigfoot, and the whole thing's over. Yeah, it's just that's it. <laughs> Take him into another dimension, and and now we got uh, get into the interdimensional Bigfoot. <laughs> that's that's how they did it. <laughs> no, <laughs> but uh. Let everyone know in the chat. I put the link in the description, but let everyone know how to find your page and everything, uh, and how to find you and and uh, yeah. So I have a um, my Facebook page, um, Colin. Uh, it's it's uh, Crypto Dash Kid. You just search that, you'll be able to find it. Or uh, Facebook dot com slash Paranorm one hundred and one. Uh, you'll be able to find it. Uh, that's where I post most of my stuff. Um, I haven't been as active lately, but uh, if I do uh, start getting more active, that's where I will post stuff. Um, but if you just want to follow my personal stuff, I've been trying to get more active on Instagram, and my Instagram handle is uh, Casual Swamp Demon. Um, so feel free to check that out too. Beautiful. I'm definitely gonna. Uh... Let's see. Is it's it's follow on Instagram, not subscribe. I'll be following that. Yeah. You said casual swamp demon. Yep. I love it. It's beautiful. Uh, before you go, if you would, and you don't have to. Some people don't. Some people do. But if you would do a wolf howl for us for the Wolf Pack Squad, uh, that would be beautiful. I'd be honored. Woo -woo! Beautiful. Thank you so much, man. <laughs> And thank you for, thanks for having me on. It's been a blast. Yeah, thanks for coming on and telling us all these awesome stories. And uh, I look forward to uh, seeing you at a conference or convention somewhere. I know I'll see you somewhere. Yeah, I'm always around. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, man. Well, well, have a great night and uh, best of luck on all your projects and everything. And and yeah, keep keep uh, keep working on everything you're working on, man. Thank you, and you as well. Thanks, man. Have a great night. All right, everyone, that was Colin Schneider, the Crypto Kid. Very interesting guy. I really enjoyed uh, talking to him at Mothman Fest. I knew I had to get him on the show. And um, 
So we did it, and and I look forward to seeing what he comes out comes up with in the future. I know uh, I need to pick up his book as well. Uh, it is called the Ramblings of Teenage Cryptozoologists. I really like the name too. Like it's like I saw it at Mothman Fest, but I was not uh, able to purchase very many things this year. I'm gonna go a little. I'm gonna go hard at Mothman Fest. It's my birthday, right? That's what I gotta do. Anyway, I hope you guys. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the show. For anyone that missed the beginning, I told a little story that happened last night uh, on the full moon night with some light anomalies that me and Brittany saw here. Uh, also about this possible new location, a a little mine and old mining buildings out in the woods. Like so, there's an abandoned mine behind my house. But further in the woods, there's more, and, I, and I, I'm going to be going back and exploring a little bit. Don't worry, I don't don't plan on going into the mines as they can collapse. Uh, you know, they're they've been sitting there abandoned for years. It's not a good idea to go in them uh, if you're not experienced, and I'm not experienced with that. I do want to go see them though, and maybe find some of these old buildings and see what's out there. It's actually a cross from uh some of the spots i've been squatching at recently that i've had some interesting experience um but yeah i hope everyone had a great uh, full moon <laughs> it was a crazy day for me we had car trouble and doctor trouble and all kinds of stuff going on um but things are getting better i think i told you guys last time about how i'm uh trying to get this sleep study done to figure out some issues i've been having uh, but as soon as I get that figured out, I'll be back full force, and it's already been uh, I've already been doing some some changes to try and uh, increase my my health. Oh, you want me to tell the story again, Joe? I will tell the story again, uh, except for this time. Let me tell you guys this story, okay? There's a little mining ghost that Brittany has been seeing in the house uh, multiple times. This little kid with like mining garb on, and he runs through around the servants quarter stairs but also through the office well it used to be the mining officer's office downstairs and it's uh, pretty crazy because I've seen something similar I didn't see a full bodied apparition like that but I see this short shadow figure uh, he's about um, like maybe I guess I would say four below four feet tall uh, shadow figure that I've seen uh, it, the other night I was sitting there and it ran past the door into the laundry room, which is the stairwell that leads up to where the servants quarters was. And I said, Brittany, I just saw, I think I just saw the kid. Um, of course I didn't see his features, but it was a short shadow figure. So onto the future here, Joe and me have heard this kid come through on the gateway, came through at the cabin at Hills Bar Dam and it came through a couple other times. I, I can't remember exactly where. But Joe, I've been wondering if that could be the kid. Um, but then again, we have all kinds of stuff going on here. 116-year-old house. It's 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 a madhouse. Just like Madhouse, the paranormal documentary. April 20th. And guess what? We can now announce, guys, that we are going to be... Uh, that will be released on Viddy Space as well as Amazon and the premiere is april 6th madison ohio we've sold out on vip tickets but if you're in the area and want to come we still have viewing tickets left for only ten dollars you can come watch the movie hang out with us at madison seminary and also we're going to do a little q a oh you want to hear the zing zing let's tell the zing zing and then i'm going to hop off the zing zing story me and joe were in hales bar dam deep in the tunnels just me and joe hanging out we did a little spirit box we did a little little experiments there and we're getting ready to walk out we're talking about how crazy the dam can get and about how quiet it had been this day so far when all of a sudden we hear ring 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 we were like what what was that ring third ring literally sounded like an old telephone ringing but we kept joking about that it was a guy on a bike going by going zing, 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 <laughs> just ringing this little bell riding through the tunnels. Even though there's no reason that a tunnel would have a guy on a bike on there. But, 
All right, all right, all right. I hope everyone enjoyed the show. Thanks to Colin Schneider for coming on. It was uh, it was awesome. I love hearing those old stories, and um, like he said, it's very important to have people like him doing that historical research, uh, such as uh, Lewis O. Powell, the Southern Spirit Guide, my good friend. So huge thanks to Colin, the Crypto Kid. Be sure to uh, swing over and drop a like on his page, and um, and yeah, like he said, if you know that guy from that that story about the chickens, uh, send him over his way. And I'll see you guys next Wednesday on the podcast. And also, uh, I'm going to do my best to get a live stream in soon. Uh, you know, I'm trying to deal with all this doctor stuff first, and then I'm going to go come in full force and destroy the game. So be looking out. Uh, new videos coming as well. I'm also working on some some bigger projects. And yeah, I thank you guys so much for listening. I will see you guys next time and...